black silk coat embroidered along the sleeves with golden blood roses among their hooked thorns. Blood roses for loss and remembrance. Fitting. His boots had taken on a gleam he had never expected Bulin to achieve. He was armored as well as he could be. With a weapon in hand, there was little he feared, but Edain's weapons would not be steel. He had small experience in the kind of battle he needed to fight now. Giving Anya and Esne each a silver mark and Bulin a silver penny, Mistress Romero would have been outraged to be offered coin, but a visitor's servants expected something on the first day and on the last. He sent the boy to make sure the stables had followed his instructions about Cat Dancer, and set the women in the corridor to guard his door. Then he sat down to wait. His meetings with the Dane must be public, with as many people around as possible. In private, all advantage belonged to a man's kind of era. He found himself wondering where Alice had gone, what she had wanted with him and the others, and tried to shake her out of his head. Even absent, the woman was a cocklebird down the back of his neck. A tall silver pitcher of tea sat on one of the carved side tables, doubtless flavored with berries and mint, and another of wine, but he ignored them. He was not thirsty, and he needed a clear head and focus for Edain. Waiting, he assumed the Cody, and sat wrapped in emotionless emptiness. It was always better to go into battle without emotion. In a shockingly short time, Anya re-entered, carefully closing the door behind her. My lord, the Lady Adain sends a request for your presence in her chambers. Her tone was very neutral, her face as blank as an ice had eyes. Tell her messenger I have not yet recovered from my journey, he said. Anya seemed disappointed with that answer as she curtsied. Courtesy demanded he be given time for that recovery, as much as he required. But in less than half an hour, by the gilded ball clock on the mantel over the fireplace, Anya entered again, carrying a letter sealed with a crouching lioness impressed in blue wax. A crouching lioness ready to spring. Edain's personal sigil, and worthy of her. He broke it reluctantly. The letter was very short. Come to me, sweetling. Come to me now. There was no signature, but he would have needed none had the sealing wax been blank. Her elaborate hand remained as familiar to him as his own far plainer. The letter was very like Edain. Commanding. Edain had been born to be a queen, and knew it. He consigned the page to the flames in the fireplace. There was no seeming about Anya's disappointment this time. Like the woman had been placed to serve him, but Edain had an ally in her if she knew it. Very likely Edain did. She had a way of learning anything that might be of use to her. No more summonses came from Edain, but as the ball clock chimed three times for the hour, Mistress Romera appeared. My lord, she said formally, are you rested enough to be received by the Prince Consort? At last. It was an honor to be conducted by her personally, but outsiders needed a guide to find their way anywhere in the palace. He had been there many times and still lost himself upon occasion. His sword remained on the lacquered rack by the door. It would do him no good here, and would insult Briss besides, indicating he thought he needed to protect himself, which he did, only not with steel. He expected a private meeting first, but Mistress Romera took him to a large formal hall with a dome painted like the sky in the center of the high ceiling, its base supported by thin fluted white columns, and the hall was full of people and a murmur of conversation that died as his arrival was noticed. Soft-footed servants in livery moved through the crowd, offering spiced wine to Kandori lords and ladies in silks embroidered with house sigils, and to folk in fine woolens worked with the sigils of the more important guilds. And to others, too. Land saw men in long coats wearing the Hadori. Many new had not worn it in these ten years or more. Women with hair still cut at the shoulders and higher wore the small dot of the Kaisain painted on their foreheads. They bowed at his appearance and made deep curtsies, those men and women who had decided to remember Malkir. They watched the Shatayan present him to Briss like hawks watching a field mouse, or like hawks awaiting a signal to take wing. Perhaps he never should have come here. Too late for that decision now. The only way was forward, whatever lay at the end. 
Prince Briss was a stocky, rough-hewn man in his middle years who appeared more suited to armor than to his gold-worked green silks, though in truth he was accustomed to either. Briss was Athenaella's sword-bearer, the general of her armies, as well as her consort, and he had not come by the office through marrying Athenaella. Briss owned a strong reputation as a general. He caught Lan's shoulders, refusing to allow him to bow. None of that from the man who twice saved my life in the Blight, Lan, he laughed. And twice you saved mine, Lan said. Honors are even. That's as may be, that's as may be. But your coming seems to have rubbed some of your luck off on Durek. He fell from a balcony this morning, a good fifty feet to the paving stones without breaking a bone. He motioned to his second son, a handsome dark-eyed boy of eight in a coat like his. The child came forward. A large bruise marred the side of his head and he moved with the stiffness of other bruises, yet he made a formal bow spoiled only somewhat by a wide grin. He should be at his lessons, Briss confided. But he was so eager to meet you, he'd have forgotten his letters and cut himself on a sword. Frowning, the boy protested that he would never cut himself. Lan returned the lad's bow with equal formality, but the last shreds of protocol vanished from the boy in an instant. They say you fought Aiel in the south and on the Shinaran marches, my lord, he said. Is that true? Are they really ten feet tall? Do they really veil their faces before they kill and eat their dead? Is the White Tower really taller than a mountain? Give the man a chance to answer, Durek, Briss said, mock outrage spoiled by amused laughter. The boy blushed in embarrassment, but still managed an affectionate smile for his father, who ruffled his hair with a quick hand. Recall what it is like to be eight, Briss, Lan said. Let the boy show his excitement. For himself, at eight he had been learning the Code D, and what he would face when he first entered the Blight, beginning to learn how to kill with his hands and feet. Let Durek have a happier childhood before he had to think too closely on death. Freed. Durek unleashed another torrent of questions, though he did wait for answers this time. Given a chance, the boy would have drained him dry about the Aiel and the wonders of the great cities in the south like Tarvala and Far Matting. Likely, he would not have believed Chachin was as big as either of those. At last, his father put an end to it. Lord Mandragoran will fill your head to your heart's content later, Briss told the boy. There is someone else he must meet now. Off with you to Mistress Tuval, and your books. Lan thought everyone in the room was holding their breath in anticipation as Briss escorted him across the red and white floor tiles. Edain was exactly as he remembered. Oh, ten years older, with touches of white streaking her temples and a few fine lines at the corners of her eyes, but those large dark eyes gripped him. Her kaisain was still the white of a widow, and her hair still hung in black waves below her waist. She wore a red silk gown in the Domani style, clinging and a little short of sheer. She was beautiful, but even she could do nothing here. He made his bow calmly. For a moment she merely looked at him, cool and considering. It would have been easier had you come to me, she murmured, seeming not to care whether Briss heard. And then, shockingly, she knelt gracefully and took his hands in hers. Beneath the light, she announced in a strong, clear voice, I, Edain Tigamalan Errol, pledge fealty to Al Alan Mandragoran, Lord of the Seven Towers, Lord of the Lakes, the true blade of Malkir. May he sever the shadow. Even Briss looked startled. A moment of silence held while she kissed Lan's fingers. Then cheers erupted on every side. Cries of, The Golden Crane! And even, Kandor rides with Malkir! The sound freed him to pull his hands loose, to lift her to her feet. My lady, he said quietly, but in a tight voice, there is no king of Malkir. The great lords have not cast the rods. She put a hand over his lips. A warm hand. Three of the surviving five are in this room, Lan. Shall we ask them how they will cast? What must be, will be. And then she faded back into the crowd of those who wanted to cluster around him, congratulate him, 
pledge fealty on the spot had he let them. Briss rescued him, drawing him off to a long stone-railed walk above a 200-foot drop to the roofs below. It was known as a place Briss went to be private, and no one followed. Only one door led onto it, no window overlooked it, and no sound from the palace intruded. Had I known she intended that, the elder man said as they walked up and down, hands clasped behind their backs, I would never have given her welcome. If you wish it, I'll let her know that welcome is withdrawn. Don't look at me that way, man. I know enough Malkieri customs not to insult her. She has you neatly nailed into a box I know you would never choose for yourself. Briss knew less than he thought he did. However delicate the words, withdrawing the welcome would be a deadly insult. Even the mountains will be worn down with time, Land quoted. He was unsure whether he could avoid leading men into the Blight now. Unsure that he wanted to avoid it. All of those men and women remembering Nalkir. Nalkir deserved remembrance, but at what price? What will you do? A simple question, simply stated, yet very hard to answer. I do not know, Lan replied. She had won only a skirmish, but he felt stunned at the ease of it. A formidable opponent, the woman who wore part of his soul in her hair. For the rest, they spoke quietly of hunting and bandits, and whether this past year's flare-up in the Blight might die down soon. Briss regretted withdrawing his army from the war against the Aiel, but there had been no alternative. They talked to the rumors about a man who could channel. Every tale had him in a different place. Briss thought it another Jack of the Mists, and Lan agreed. And of the Aes Sedai, who seemed to be everywhere, for what reason, no one knew. Nathaniella had written him that, in a village along her progression, two sisters had caught a woman pretending to be Aes Sedai. The woman could channel, but that did her no good. The two real Aes Sedai flogged her squealing through the village, making her confess her crime to every last man and woman who lived there. Then one of the sisters carried her off to Tarvalan for her true punishment, whatever that might be. Lan found himself hoping that Alice had not lied about being Aes Sedai, though he could not think why he should care. He hoped to avoid a Dane the rest of the day, too, but when he was guided back to his rooms, by a serving man this time, she was there, waiting languorously in one of the gilded chairs in the sitting room. His servants were nowhere to be seen. It seemed Anya truly was a Dane's ally. You are no longer beautiful, I fear, sweetling, she said when he came in. I think you may even be ugly when you are older. But I always enjoyed your eyes more than your face. Her smile became sultry. And your hands. He stopped still, gripping the door handle. My lady, not two hours gone, you swore. She cut him off. And I will obey my king. But as the saying goes, a king is not a king, alone with his Kanaira. She laughed, a smoky laugh, enjoying her power over him. I brought you Deori. Bring it to me. Unwillingly, his eyes followed hers to a flat, lacquered box on a small table beside the door. Lifting the hinged lid took as much effort as lifting a boulder. Coiled inside lay a long cord woven of hair. He could recall every moment of the morning after their first night when she took him to the women's quarters of the royal palace in Felmoran and let ladies and serving women watch as she cut his hair at his shoulders. She even told them what it signified. The women had all been amused, making jokes as he sat at Adain's feet to weave the deori for her. Adain kept custom, but in her own way. The hair felt soft and supple. She must have had it rubbed with lotions every day. Crossing the floor slowly, he knelt before her and held out his deore stretched between his hands. In token of what I owe to you, Edain, always and forever. If his voice did not hold the fervor of that first morning, surely she understood. She did not take the cord. Instead, she studied him, a lioness studying a fawn. 
I knew you had not been gone so long as to forget our ways, she said finally. Come. Rising, she grasped his wrist and drew him to the doors to the balcony overlooking the garden ten paces below. Two servants were pouring water from buckets onto chosen plants, and a young woman was strolling along a slate path in a blue dress as bright as any of the early flowers that grew beneath the trees. My daughter, Isella. For a moment, pride and affection warmed to Dane's voice. Do you remember her? She is seventeen now. She hasn't chosen her Carneira yet. Young men were chosen by their Carneira. Young women chose theirs. But I think at times she married anyway. He vaguely recalled a child who always had servants running, the blossom of her mother's heart. But his head had been full of Edain then. Like the woman filled his head now, just as the scent of her perfume filled his nose. The scent of her. She is as beautiful as her mother, I am sure, he said politely. He twisted the Deori in his hands. She had too much advantage as long as he held it. All advantage. But she had to take it from him. Edain, we must talk. She ignored that. Time you were married too, sweetling. Since none of your female relatives is alive, it is up to me to arrange. She smiled warmly toward the girl below, a loving mother's smile. He gasped at what she seemed to be suggesting. At first he could not believe. Isella, he said hoarsely. Your daughter? She might keep custom in her own way, but this was scandalous. I'll not be reined into something so shameful, Edain. Not by you, or by this. He shook the Deori at her, but she only looked at it and smiled. Of course you won't be arraigned, sweetling. You are a man, not a boy. Yet you do keep custom, she mused, running a finger along the cord of hair quivering between his hands. Perhaps we do need to talk. But it was to the bed that she led him. At least he would regain some lost ground there whether or not she took the Deori from his hands. He was a man, not a fawn, however much the lioness she was. He was not surprised when she told him he could lay it aside to help her undress, though. Edain would never give up all of her advantage. Not until she presented his Deori to his bride on his wedding day. And he could see no way to stop that bride, being Izella. Chapter 23 the Evening Star Moiraine allowed herself a small smile as Lan's friends galloped after him. If he wanted to be away from her so quickly, then she had made some impression. A deeper one had to wait. So he thought she needed to avoid the rougher parts of Chachin, did he? The way she handled those bandits should have taught him better. Putting him out of her mind, she went in search of exactly those rougher quarters. When she and Swan had been allowed a trip into Tarvalin as accepted, the common rooms Swan liked to visit were always in that sort of area. Their food and wine were cheap, and they were unlikely to be frequented by Aes Sedai, who would surely have disapproved of accepted having a cup of wine in such a place. Besides, Swan said she felt more comfortable in those inns than at the better establishments where Moiraine would have preferred to eat. Besides, tight-fisted as Swan was, she certainly would have sought out a room at the cheapest inn to be found. Moiraine rode through the crowded streets until she found a place inside the first ring wall where there were no sedan chairs or street musicians, and the rare push-barrow vendors had no patrons and faces without hope of having any soon. The stone buildings lining the narrow street had a shabby appearance that belied their brightly tiled roofs, cracked paint on doors and window frames where there was any paint, dirty windows with broken panes. Ragged children ran laughing and playing, but children played and laughed in the direst surroundings. Shopkeepers with cudgels stood guard over the goods displayed on tables in front of their shops, and eyed the passers-by as though considering every one of them capable of theft. Maybe some of those folk were, in their worn patched woolens, scuttling along with head down or swaggering with defiant scowls. 
A poor woman might easily be tempted into theft when she had nothing. Moiraine's fur-lined cloak and silk riding dress drew furtive glances, and so did Arrow. There was not another horse on the street. As she dismounted in front of the first inn she came to, a dusty-appearing place called the Ruffled Goose, a slat-ribbed yellow dog growled at her, hackles standing, till she flicked it with a fine flow of air and sent it yelping down the street. Of more concern was a tall young woman in a much-darned red dress that had faded in patches of different shades. She was pretending to search for a stone in her shoe while eyeing arrows sideways. A covetous gaze, that. There were no hitching posts or rings here. Letting the reins hang free, which would tell Arrow not to move, Moiraine wove hobbles of air for the mare's forefeet, and a ward around her that would warn if anyone tried to move the animal. That one she held on to rather than tying off. The dim common room of the ruffled goose bore out the exterior. The floor was covered with what might have been sawdust once, but now appeared to be congealed mud. The air stank of stale tabac smoke and sour ale, and something that seemed to be scorching in the kitchen. The patrons huddled over their mugs at the small tables. Rough-faced men in rough coats lifted their heads in surprise at her entrance. The innkeeper proved to be a lean, leathery fellow in a stained gray coat, with his narrow face cast in a permanent leer, as villainous in appearance as any of those bandits on the high road had been. Do you have a tyrant woman staying here? she asked. A young tyrant woman with blue eyes? This isn't the place for the likes of you, my lady, he muttered, rubbing a wiry hand across his stubbly cheek. He might have rearranged some dirt. Come, let me show you to something more fit. He started for the door, but she laid a hand on his sleeve. Lightly. Some of the stains on his coat appeared to be encrusted food, and up close he smelled as though he had not washed in weeks. The Tyran woman. I've never seen a blue-eyed Tyran. Please, my lady, I know a fine inn, a grand place only two streets over. The ward she had set on Arrow tingled against her skin. Thank you, no, she told the innkeeper, and hurried outside. The woman in the faded red dress was trying to lead Arrow away, tugging at the reins and growing increasingly frustrated at the mare's tiny mincing steps. I would abandon that notion if I were you, Moiraine said loudly. The penalty for horse theft is flogging if the horse is recovered and worse if not. Every accepted was required to become acquainted with the more common laws of the different nations. The young woman spun, mouth dropping open. Apparently she had believed she had more time before Moiraine came out. Surprise vanished quickly, though, and she straightened her back and laid a hand on her long-bladed belt knife. I suppose you think you can make me, she said, contemptuously eyeing Moiraine up and down. It would have been a pleasure to send the woman off with a few stripes across her back, but doing so might well have revealed who she was. A number of passers-by, Men and women and children had stopped to watch. Not to interfere, just to see the outcome. I will if I must, Moiraine said calmly, coolly. The young woman frowned, licking her lips and fingering the hilt of her knife. Abruptly, she flung down Arrow's reins. Keep her, then. Truth is, she isn't worth stealing. Turning her back, she strode away, shooting defiant glares in every direction. Temper flared in Moiraine, and she channeled air, striking the woman a hard blow across the bottom. A very hard blow. With a shriek, the woman leaped at least a foot in the air. Gripping her knife hilt, she spun about, scowling and searching for who had hit her, but there was no one closer than two paces, and people were looking at her in open puzzlement. She started off again, rubbing herself with both hands. Moiraine gave a small nod of satisfaction. Perhaps in the future the would-be horse thief would know not to insult another woman's horse. Her satisfaction did not last long. At the second inn on the street, the blind pig, a round-faced, squinting woman in a long apron that might have once been white cackled that she had no tyrants in her rooms. Every word out of her mouth came with a shrill laugh. 
best you be off, girl, she said as well. My trade will have a pretty tender like you for dinner if you don't scurry away quick. Tilting her head back, she roared with laughter that her customers echoed. At the Silver Penny, the last inn on the street, the innkeeper was a beautiful woman in her middle years, not too overly tall, with a joyous smile and glossy black hair worn in a thick braid that started to top her head. Wonder of wonders, Nadir Satarov's brown woolen dress was neat, clean, and well cut, and her common room floor was freshly swept. Her patrons were rough-faced men and hard-eyed women, but the smells from the kitchen promised something tolerable. Why, yes, my lady, she said. I do have a tyrant woman of that description staying here. She's gone out just now. Why don't you have a seat and some nice spiced wine while you wait for her? She held out a wooden mug she had been carrying when she first approached. The mug gave off the sweet smell of fresh spices. Thank you, Moiraine said, returning the woman's smile with one just as bright. What luck to find Swan so fast. But her hand stopped, just short of the mug. Something had altered in Mistress Satarov's expression, just by a hair, but there was definitely a slight air of anticipation about her now, and she had been carrying the mug when she approached. Moraine had not seen a sign of wine in the first two inns. No one in this part of the city could afford wine. Spices could cover many other tastes. Embracing the source, she wove spirit in one of the blue's secret weaves and touched the innkeeper with it. Slight anticipation became definite unease. Are you certain the young woman meets my description exactly? She asked, and tightened the weave a fraction. Sweat appeared on Mr. Sitarov's forehead. Are you absolutely certain? Another tightening and an edge of fear appeared in the woman's eyes. Come to think she doesn't have blue eyes at that, and... And she left this morning, come to think. How many unwary visitors have you fed wine? Moiraine asked coldly. How many women? Do you leave them alive? Or simply wishing they were dead? I... I don't know what you're talking about. If you'll excuse me, I... Drink, Moiraine commanded, tightening the weave to just short of panic. Trembling, Mistress Sitarov was unable to break free from her gaze. Drink it all. Still staring into Moiraine's eyes, the woman raised the mug unsteadily to her mouth, and her throat worked convulsively as she swallowed. Abruptly, her eyes widened as she realized what she was doing, and with a cry, she flung the mug away in a spray of wine. Moiraine released the weave, but that did not lessen Mistress Sitarov's fear. The woman's face contorted with terror as she gazed around her common room. Hoisting her skirts above her knees, she began running toward the kitchens, perhaps the stairs at the back of the room, yet in three paces she was staggering from side to side, and in three more she collapsed to the floor as though her bones had melted, her stockinged legs exposed to the thigh. Silk stockings. The woman had made a tidy profit from her vile trade. She waved her arms as though seeking to crawl, but there was no strength in them. Some of the men and women at the tables looked at Moiraine in wonderment, doubtless amazed that she was not the one lying on the floor. But most seemed to be studying Mr. Satarov's futile attempts to claw her way along. A wiry man with a long scar down his face gained a slow smile that never touched his eyes. A heavy-set fellow with a blacksmith's shoulders licked his lips. By twos and threes, women began hurrying out into the street, many shrinking back from Warren as they passed her. Some of the men went, too. She joined the exodus without looking back. Sometimes justice came from other than laws or swords. That was how the rest of her day went, finding the scattered districts where people's clothes were worn and patched and everyone went afoot. In Chachin, a matter of five streets could take you from the homes and shops of craftsmen who were at least moderately prosperous, to squalid poverty and back again. Rulers always tried to do something about those in need, if they were good and decent rulers, and she had heard that Atheniela was considered generous, yet every time one man was lifted from penury, another seemed to fall into it. That might not be fair, but it was the way of the world. The frustration of it was another reason she wanted to avoid the Sun Throne. 
She asked in common rooms filled with drunken shouts and laughter, and in grim ones where the men and women at the table seemed to want only to drown their troubles in drink. But no one admitted to seeing a blue-eyed young tyrant woman. Three more times she was offered wine under suspicious circumstances, but she did not repeat what she had done to Mistress Sitarov. Not that she was not tempted, but word of that sort of thing would spread. Once might be dismissed as rumor, four was something else again. Any blue hearing about that would certainly suspect another blue was in the city. She disliked thinking that a blue sister could really be black, but any sister at all could be, and she needed to remain hidden as long as she could manage. Twice she was attacked by pairs of men who seized Arrow's bridle and tried to claw her from the saddle. Had there been more, she might have had to reveal herself, but the fear-inducing weave at full strength sent them dashing away through the crowds in mindless panic. Onlookers stared at the running men in amazement, obviously wondering why strong men intent on stealing a horse should suddenly flee. Yet, unless there was a wilder among them, no one was any the wiser. No fewer than seven more times, someone tried to steal Arrow while she was inside an inn. Once it was a pack of children she scattered with a shout. Another time, half a dozen young men, who thought they could ignore her, until she sent them leaping and yelping their way down the street under a flurry of air-woven switches. It was not that Chachin was any more lawless than other cities, but she was in places where silk clothing and a fur-lined cloak and a fine horse were simply signs that she was ripe for plucking. Had she lost Arrow there, a magistrate might well have said it was her own fault. There was nothing for it but to grit her teeth and move on. Cold daylight began to settle toward yet another icy night. She was walking Arrow through lengthening shadows, eyeing darknesses that moved suspiciously in an alley and thinking that she would have to give up for today, when Swan came bustling up from behind. I thought you might look down here when you came, Swan said, taking her elbow to hurry her along. She was wearing the same blue wool riding dress, Moiraine doubted she had even considered spending some of the coin Moiraine had given her on another. I've been haunting these regions looking for you. Let's get inside before we freeze. Swan eyed those shadows in the alley too, and absently fingered her belt knife, as if using the power could not deal with any ten of them. Well, not without revealing themselves. Perhaps it was best to move quickly. Not the quarter for you, Moiraine. There are fellows around here would bloody well have you for dinner before you knew you were in the pot. Are you laughing or choking? Both, Moiraine replied with some difficulty. How often today had she heard some variation on her being something to be cooked and eaten if she was not careful? She had to stop and hug the other woman. Oh, Swan, it is so good to see your face. Where are you staying? Somewhere that serves fish, I suppose. May I at least hope the beds lack fleas and lice? Maybe it isn't what you're used to, Swan replied, but a sound roof to keep off rain is really all you need. And there are no sisters there, so you can chase fleas and lice to your heart's content. But we'd better hurry if we want to reach it before full dark. Moiraine sighed and hurried. After dark was not a good time to be out near the sorts of places Swan favored. Swan, it turned out, had a room at a most respectable inn called the Evening Star, three sprawling stories of stone that catered to merchants of middling rank, especially women unwilling to be bothered by noise or rough sorts in the spacious common room. A pair of bull-shouldered fellows leaning against blue-painted columns as they kept watch on the front door made sure there was none of that. In truth, they were the only men in the room. A good many of the tables were taken by women, most in well-cut but plain woolens, with only a brooch or earrings for jewelry, and two with the chains of the Kandori Merchants Guild looping across their bosoms, though three in bright Damani dresses, discussing something heatedly if in low voices, wore tall chain necklaces of gold that covered their entire necks. A grey-haired woman plying her hammers on a dulcimer was striking a quiet yet merry tune, and the smells from the kitchen spoke of lamb roasting, not fish. The innkeeper, Eileen Tolvina, was a lean woman with an air of brooking little nonsense, in a grey dress embroidered with a sprinkling of blue flowers on the shoulders. She had no rooms free, but she made no objection to Moiraine joining Swan. 
So long as the extra for two is paid, she added, holding out a hand. Silks and fur were insufficient to bring curtsies from Mistress Tolvina. I can chase fleas to my heart's content, Moiraine said, hanging her cloak on a peg in Swan's small room on the top floor. At least it was warm, with a stove built under the not very wide bed, and tidy. Swan was never untidy. I am surprised you are staying here. The extra had been a silver penny, which meant Swan must be paying too. You'll just have to call the fleas first. Why surprised? Swan settled cross-legged on the bed, yet she all but bounced. She seemed invigorated since Canluam. A goal always made Swan bubble with enthusiasm. Moiraine did not answer the question. They were going to be sharing that bed, and Swan knew exactly which ticklish spots could reduce her to helpless laughter and pleading. What have you learned? A great deal and nothing. I've had a time, Moiraine, I tell you. That fool horse nearly beat me to death getting here. The Creator made people to walk or go by boat, not be bounced around. I suppose the Sahira woman wasn't the one or you'd be jumping like a ladyfish in spring. I found Ines de Maine almost right off, but not where I can reach her. She's a new widow, but she did have a son for sure. Named him Rahin because she saw the dawn come up over Dragon Mount. Talk of the streets. Everybody thinks it a fool reason to name a child. Moiraine pushed down a momentary thrill. Seeing dawn over the mountain did not mean the child had been born on it. There was no chair or stool nor room for one, so she sat on the end of the bed, wrapping her arms around her knees. If you have found Ines and her son, Swan, why is she out of reach? She's in the bloody Ace Daishar Palace, that's why. Swan could have gained entry easily as Aes Sedai, but otherwise only if the palace was hiring servants. The Aes Daishar Palace. We will take care of that in the morning, Moiraine sighed. It meant risk, yet the Lady Ines had to be questioned. No woman Moiraine had found yet had been able to see Dragon Mount when her child was born. Have you seen any sign of... of the Black Adra? She had to get used to saying that name. Swan frowned at her lap and fingered her divided skirt. This is a strange city, Moiraine, she said finally. Lamps in the streets and women who fight duels even if they do deny it, and more gossip than ten men full of ale could spew. Some of it is interesting. She leaned forward to put a hand on Moiraine's knee. Everybody's talking about a young blacksmith who died of a broken back a couple of nights ago. Nobody expected much of him, but this last month or so he turned into quite a speaker. Convinced his guild to take up money for the poor who've come into the city, afraid of the bandits. Folks not connected to a guild or house. Swan? What under the light? Just listen, Moiraine. He collected a lot of silver himself, and it seems he was on his way to the guild house to turn in six or eight bags of it when he was killed. Fool was carrying it all by himself. The point is, there wasn't a bloody coin of it taken, Moiraine. And he didn't have a mark on him aside from his broken back. They shared a long look. Then Moiraine shook her head. I cannot see how to tie that to Malin or Tamra. A blacksmith? Swan, we can go mad thinking we see black sisters everywhere. We can die from thinking they aren't there, Swan replied. Well, maybe we can be Silverpike in the nets instead of grunters. Just remember Silverpike go to the fish market too. What do you have in mind about this lady, Ines? Moiraine told her. Swan did not like it and this time it took most of the night to make her see sense. In truth, Moiraine almost wished Swan would talk her into trying something else. But Lady Ines had seen dawn over Dragon Mount. At least Atheniella's Aes Sedai advisor was with her in the south. Chapter 24 Making Use of Invisibility Swan started up again while they were dressing the next morning. She disliked being argued out of anything, particularly when she thought herself in the right. And she usually did think herself in the right. I don't like you taking all the risks, she muttered, pulling a blue wool dress over her head. She had brought a change, as it turned out, and she had been near to snippy and pointing out that Moiraine was the one with only a single dress to her name. I will not be taking all the risks, Moiraine said, suppressing a sigh. 
They had gone over this and over it last night. You must take as many as I. Will you help me with these buttons? Swan turned her around by the shoulders almost roughly and attacked the two rows of small mother-of-pearl buttons that ran down her back. Don't be a gudgeon, she grumbled, tugging at the dress much more fiercely than was necessary. If this works as you say it will, nobody will notice me. You'll have all sails set, the sweeps out and banners flying. I say there has to be a better way and we're going to sit down and talk it over till you see the right of it. Moraine did sigh then. A bear with a sore tooth would have been better company, even that fellow Lan. Doing up Swan's buttons in turn, she tried distracting the other woman by telling her how much the cut of the dress molded her hips and bosom. Well, for a little more than distraction, Swan deserved a bit of snippiness back. It does attract men's eyes, Swan replied, and giggled. She even gave her hips a twitch. Moiraine thought she might spend the whole day sighing. When they went down, with their cloaks folded over their arms, the common room was nearly full of merchants chatting over breakfast, still all women. The two Kandori, one with three chains across her chest, the other with two, were eating hurriedly and beaming like women who foresaw a prosperous day ahead. Some had done business the night before, it seemed. One slender woman in dark grey was eyeing her plump, complacent companion with the sickly expression of someone who had been brought near financial ruin. The three Damani picked at their plates, pushing the food around with their forks. By their tight eyes and pallid faces, they were all nursing sore heads from too much drink. A big breakfast and then we can talk, Swan said, going on tiptoe to scan the room for an empty table. The kitchens here make a fine breakfast. Rolls that we can eat on the way, Moraine said firmly, and hurried toward Mistress Tolvina, who was giving instructions to a serving girl in a snowy apron with a blue border. The only way to win an argument with Swan was to sweep her along. If you let up for an instant, you would find yourself the one being swept. Good morning, Mistress Tolvina, she said as the innkeeper turned from the waiting girl. We wish to hire two of your men to escort us for a few hours this morning. The pair watching the door this morning were different from those who had been on duty last night, though just as large. The lean woman's eyebrows rose slightly, increasing her no-nonsense air. Again there was no curtsy, though Moiraine had used the power to make sure her dress looked fresh from the laundress. Why? If you've gotten yourself engaged in a duel, I'll have no part of it. A fool thing, these whip duels and the like, and I'll not abet you. You'd just come back lashed bloody in any case. I certainly doubt you've ever fought before. Moraine bit her tongue. Swan said the innkeeper had all sorts of rules, from locking the outside doors at midnight to no male visitors in rooms and enforced them strictly. But she would not have spoken so had she known they were eyes to die. I wish to visit a banker, she said, once she could trust herself to speak. Getting them thrown out of Swan's room would not be a disaster, but it would be inconvenient. They had a great deal to do today. A good and reputable banker, do you know of one nearby? As it happened, Mistress Tolvina did, the one she herself used, and for that purpose she was willing to have two of her watchers, as she called them, rousted from their rooms over the stable. For an amount, Moiraine was sure at least doubled their daily wage. She paid at once, though. Objecting would only waste time and might drive the price up. Eileen Tolvina did not look like a woman who bargained. Soon enough, she and Swan were sitting facing each other in a large sedan chair borne by four wiry men who hardly looked strong enough to bear the weight, though they trotted up the crowded streets much more easily than the pair of tall men who escorted the chair carrying long brass studded cudgels. This isn't going to work, Swan muttered between gnaws at a large crusty roll. If you think we need more money, all right. Though you do fling it around, Moiraine. But burn me, this scheme of yours will never work. We'll be netted right away. They'll probably send for a sister, if there isn't one there already. I tell you, we have to find another way. Moiraine pretended to be too busy eating her own roll, still warm from the oven, to answer. Besides, she was hungry. If they encountered another Aes Sedai, that was a chasm they would have to cross when they came to it. She told herself the flutter in her belly was hunger, not fear. 
but you could think a line. Her plan had to work. There was no other way. As in Tarvalon, the bank resembled a small palace, this one glittering in the morning sunlight like the real palaces farther up the mountain, with golden tiles on every wall and two tall white domes. The doorman who bowed them inside wore a dark red coat embroidered on the cuffs with silver bees, and the footmen short black coats that exposed their bottoms in their tight breeches. Moiraine's dress with the slashes of Kyrian and nobility on the front was enough to get them an interview with the banker herself, rather than an underling, in a quiet wood-paneled room with silvered stand lamps and small lines of gilding on the furniture. Camille Noallen was a lovely slim woman in her middle years, with graying hair worn in four long braids and stern, questioning eyes. Candor was a long way from Kyrian, after all, and from Tarvalon. Still, she had no call to use an enlarging glass to study Elaine Dormila's seal at the bottom of Moiraine's letter of rights. At least the letter itself was only a little blurred from its immersion in that pond. It was not the largest she carried, yet even so it produced an imposing pile of gold in ten leather pouches stacked on the banker's writing table, even after the steep discount for the distance between the two banks. You have bodyguards, I hope? Mistress Noellen murmured politely. Large quantities of gold tended to bring courtesy. Is Chachin so lawless two women are not safe by daylight? Moiraine asked her coolly. An enlarging glass. I think our business is done. A pair of very large footmen carried the purses outside and placed them on the floor of the sedan chair, looking relieved at the sight of Mistress Tolvina's two watchers with their cudgels. The bearers hoisted the extra weight effortlessly, it seemed. Even that blacksmith must have staggered, loaded down like a mule, Swan muttered, towing the purses piled between them. Who could have broken his back that way? Fish guts. Whatever the reason, Moiraine, it must be the Black Aja. The bearers could hear that clearly, but they trotted along without faltering, ignorant of what the words Black Aja meant likely ignorant of what an Aja was, for that matter. On the other hand, an imposing woman gliding by with ivory combs in her hair gave a start, then hiked her skirts to her knees and ran, leaving her two gaping servants to scramble after her through the crowd. Moiraine directed a reproving look at Swan. They could not depend on others' ignorance for protection. Swan flushed slightly, yet her blue eyes were defiant. The Evening Star had a small strong room where merchants could store their coins safely, those who did not keep strong boxes in their rooms, but placing most of the gold there did not bring any curtsies from Mistress Tolvina, even after Moiraine gave her a gold crown for her troubles. No doubt she had seen too many merchants lose everything to be impressed just because someone had coin at the moment. The best seamstress in Chachin would be Celine Dorelman, she said in answer to Moiraine's question. But she's very dear, or so I hear, very dear. Moiraine took back one of the fat purses, though it dragged her belt down on one side when she tied the strings. That blacksmith must have staggered. No, Swan was seeing Jack of the Mists, that was all. Celine proved to be a slim woman with a haughty air and a cool voice, in a shimmering blue dress with a neckline cut to show most of her cleavage. The garment barely clung to her shoulders. Moiraine did not worry over being pressed into that sort of dress, though. She intended to violate nearly every rule of propriety between a woman and her seamstress. She tolerated the measuring, since there was no way to hasten it, but Celine's eyes narrowed at the speed with which she chose fabrics and colors. For a moment it seemed she would refuse to sew what Swan needed, but Moiraine calmly said she would pay twice the usual rate. The woman's eyes went almost to slits at the mention of price, yet she nodded. And Moiraine knew she would get what she wanted. Here, at least. I want them tomorrow, she said. Put all of your seamstresses to work. Celine's eyes did not narrow at that. They widened, flashing with anger. Her voice became icy. Impossible. At the end of the month, perhaps. Perhaps later, if I can find time at all. A great many ladies have ordered new gowns. The King of Malkir is visiting the Ace Daishar Palace. The last King of Malkir died 25 years ago, Selene. 
Taking out the fat purse, Moiraine upended it over the table in the measuring room, spilling out thirty gold crowns. She was ordering more than three dresses, but while silk was as expensive in Chachin as in Tarvalin, the sewing was much less, and that was the largest expense in a dress. Celine eyed the fat coins greedily, and her eyes positively shone when she was told there would be as much again when the dresses were done. But I will keep six coins from the second thirty for each day it takes. Suddenly it seemed that the dresses could be finished sooner than a month after all. Much sooner. You should have your dresses made like what that skinny troll was wearing, Swan said as they climbed back into the sedan chair. Ready to fall off. You might as well enjoy men looking at you if you're going to lay your fool head on the chopping block. Moiraine performed a novice exercise, imaging herself a rosebud in stillness opening to the sun. Thankfully it brought calm, though holding on to it around Swan could prove trying. She would crack a tooth if she kept grinding them. There is no other way, Swan. The day was more than half gone and much remained to be done. Do you think Mistress Tolvina will hire out one of her strong arms for more than a few hours? The King of Malkir? Light. The woman must have thought her a complete fool. At mid-morning, two days after Moiraine arrived in Chachin, a yellow lacquered carriage behind a team of four matched greys, driven by a fellow with shoulders like a bull, arrived at the Ace Daishar Palace, with two mares tied behind, a fine-necked bay and a lanky grey. The Lady Moiraine Domadred, colored slashes marching from the high neck of her dark blue gown to below her knees, was received with all due honor by an upper servant with silvery keys embroidered behind the red horse on his shoulder. The name of House Domadred was known, of course, if not hers, and with Layman dead, any Domadred might ascend to the Sun Throne if another house did not seize it. They could not know how she hoped for that. She was given suitable apartments, three spacious rooms with silk tapestries on the flower-carved wall panels and a marble-railed balcony looking north across the city toward higher snow-capped peaks, and assigned servants, two maids and an errand boy, who rushed about unpacking the lady's brass-bound chests and pouring hot rose-scented water for the lady to wash. No one but the servant so much as glanced at Suki, the Lady Moiraine's maid. All right, Swan muttered when the servants finally left them alone in the sitting room. I admit I'm invisible in this. Her dark grey dress was fine wool, entirely plain except for collar and cuffs, banded in domadred colors. You, though, stand out like a high lord pulling oar. Light, I nearly swallowed my tongue when you asked if there were any sisters in the palace. I'm so nervous I'm starting to get lightheaded. It feels hard to breathe. It is the altitude, Moiraine told her. You will get used to it. Any visitor would ask about Aes Sedai. You could see the servants never blinked. She had held her breath, however, until she heard the answer. One sister would have changed everything. I do not know why I must keep telling you. A royal palace is not an inn. You may call me Lady Alice would satisfy no one here. That is fact, not opinion. I must be myself. Suppose you make use of that invisibility and see what you can learn about the Lady Ines. I would be pleased if we leave as soon as possible. Tomorrow that would be without causing insult and talk. Swan was right. Every eye in the palace would be on the outland noblewoman from the house that had started the Aeel War. Any Aes Sedai who came to the Aes Daishar would hear of her immediately, and any Aes Sedai who passed through Chachin might well come. And if this Gorthanes was still trying to find her, word of Moiraine Damadred in the Aes Daishar palace would reach his ears all too soon. In her experience, palaces were riper for assassination than highways were. Swan was right. She was standing on a pedestal like a target, and without a clue as to who might be an archer. Tomorrow. Early. Swan slipped out, but returned quickly with bad news. The Lady Ines was in seclusion mourning her husband. He fell over dead in his breakfast porridge ten days ago, she reported, dropping onto a sitting room chair and hanging an arm over the back. 
Lessons in deportment were something else forgotten once the shawl was hers. A much older man, but it seems she loved him. She's been given ten rooms in a garden on the south side of the palace. Her husband was a close friend to Prince Briss. Ines would remain to herself a full month, seeing no one but close family. Her servants only came out when absolutely necessary. She will see an Aes Sedai, Warren sighed. Not even a woman in mourning would refuse to see a sister. Swan bolted to her feet. Are you mad? The Lady Warren Domadred attracts enough attention. Warren Domadred Aes Sedai might as well send out riders. I thought the idea was to be gone before anyone outside the palace knows we were here. One of the serving women, a plump, gray-haired woman named Aiko, came in just then to announce that the Shatayan had arrived to escort Moiraine to Prince Briss, and was plainly startled to find Suki standing over her mistress and stabbing a finger at her. Tell the Shatayan I will come to her, Moiraine said calmly, and as soon as the wide-eyed woman curtsied and backed out, she rose to put herself on a more equal footing. Hard enough with Swan, even when one had all the advantage. What else do you suggest? Remaining almost two weeks till she comes out will be as bad. And you cannot befriend the servants if they are secluded with her. They may only come out for errands, Moiraine, but I think I can get myself invited inside. Moiraine started to say that might take as long as the other, but Swan took her firmly by the shoulders and turned her around, eyeing her up and down critically. A lady's maid is supposed to make sure her mistress is properly dressed, she said, and gave Moiraine a push toward the door. Go, the Shatayan is waiting for you. And with any luck, a young footman named Cal is waiting for Suki. Chapter 25 An Answer the Shatayan indeed was waiting, a tall, handsome woman wrapped in dignity and frosty at being made to wait. Her hazel eyes could have chilled wine. Any queen who got on the wrong side of a Shatayan was a fool, so Moiraine made herself pleasant as the woman escorted her through the halls. She thought she made some progress in melting that frost, but it was difficult to concentrate. A young footman? She did not know whether Swan had ever been with a man, but surely she would not, just to reach Ines's servants. Not a footman. Statues and tapestries lined the hallways, most surprising for what she knew of the borderlands. Marble carvings of women with flowers or children playing, silk weavings of fields of flowers and nobles in gardens, and only a few hunting scenes without a single battle shown anywhere. At intervals along the hall's arched windows looked down into many more gardens than she expected, too, and flagged courtyards, some with a splashing marble fountain. In one of those, she saw something that pushed questions about Swan and a footman to the back of her mind. It was a simple courtyard without fountain or columned walk, and men stood in rows along the walls watching two others, stripped to the waist and fighting with wooden practice swords, Rhine and Bukama. It was fighting, if in practice. Blows landed on flesh hard enough for her to hear the thuds. All landed by Rhine. She would have to avoid them and Lan if he was there too. He had not bothered to hide his doubts, and he might raise questions she did not dare have asked. Was she Moiraine or Alice? Worse, was she Aes Sedai or a wilder pretending? Questions that would be discussed in the streets by the next night for any sister to hear, and that last was one any sister would investigate. Fortunately, three wandering soldiers would hardly be present anywhere she was. Prince Briss, a solid, green-eyed man, greeted her intimately in a large room paneled red and gold. Two of the prince's married sisters were present with their husbands, and one of Athenella's with hers. The men in muted silks, the women in bright colors belted high beneath their breasts and embroidered down the arms and along the hems of their skirts. Liveried servants offered sweetmeats and nuts. Moiraine thought she might get a sore neck from looking up. The shortest of the women was taller than Swan, and they all stood very straight. Their necks would have bent a little for a sister, men's and women's alike, but they knew themselves the equals of the Lady Moiraine. 
The talk ranged from music and the best musicians among the nobles at court to the rigors of travel, from whether to credit rumors of a man who could channel to why so many Aes Sedai seemed to be about them and Moiraine found it difficult to maintain the expected light wittiness. She cared little for music, and less for whoever played the instruments. In Kyrian, musicians were hired and forgotten. Everyone knew that travel was arduous, with no assurance of beds or decent food at the end of the day's twenty or thirty miles, and that was when the weather was good. Obviously, some of the sisters were about because of rumors about the man, and others to tighten ties that might have loosened during the Aeol War, to make sure thrones and houses understood they were still expected to meet their obligations to the tower, both public and private. If an Aes Sedai had not come to the Aes Daishar yet, one soon would. Reason enough for her to make heavy going of idle chat. That, and thinking about other reasons for sisters to be wandering. The men put a good face on it, but she thought the women found her particularly dull. When Briss's children were brought in, Warren felt a great relief. Having his children introduced to her was a sign of acceptance to his household, but more, it signaled the end of the audience. The eldest son, Antol, was in the south, with Etheniella as heir, leaving a lovely green-eyed girl of twelve named Jareen to lead in her sister and four brothers, formally aligned by age, though in truth the two youngest boys were still in skirts and carried by nursemaids. Stifling her impatience to find out what Swan had learned, Moiraine complimented the children on their behavior, encouraged them at their lessons. They must think her as dull as their elders did. Something a little less flat. And how did you earn your bruises, my lord Dirick? she asked, hardly listening to the boy's soberly delivered story of a fall. Until... My father says it was land's luck I wasn't killed, my lady. Dirick said, brightening out of his formality. Lan is the king of Malkir and the luckiest man in the world and the best swordsman, except for my father, of course. The king of Malkir? Warren said, blinking. Dirick nodded vigorously and began explaining in a rush of words about Lan's exploits in the Blight and the Malkieri who had come to the Aes Daishar to follow him until his father motioned him to silence. Lan is a king if he wishes it, my lady, Briss said. A very odd thing to say, and his doubtful tone made it odder. He keeps much to his rooms. Briss sounded troubled about that, too. But you will meet him before you... My lady, are you well? Not very, she told him. She had hoped for another meeting with Lan Mandragoran, planned for it, but not here. Her stomach was trying to twist into knots. I myself may keep to my rooms for a few days, if you will forgive me. He would, of course, and everyone was full of regret at missing her company and sympathy for the strain traveling must have put on her, though she did hear one of the women murmur that Southlanders must be very delicate. A pale-haired young woman in green and red was waiting to show Moiraine back to her rooms. Ellis bobbed a curtsy every time she spoke, 